Okay, here is another heat transfer example problem where we'll be solving the heat equation. This time we're going to use a different type of boundary condition. So this one says sunlight hitting a horizontal wall of thickness L equals 15 centimeters creates a constant and uniform flux going into the top of the wall. On the bottom of the wall, the surface temperature is measured to be constant at 32 degrees C. Derive the temperature profile. T is a function of x, where x is the distance from the top surface of the wall. So we're going to define our coordinate system going from here down. We'll call that x. We could call it y or z. It really doesn't matter. So we're going to treat this as a plane wall. So assuming temperature only varies in one direction, which would be that downward x direction. And we're going to assume that the system is at steady state. OK, so this is really similar to a, another example problem that we solved, except now we're being asked, instead of just asking what surface temperatures are, we're being asked what the temperature profile is. So how does temperature change depending on where we are, how deep we are into this wall? OK, so how do we start? You might be thinking energy balance, and you would be right, except you need to remember when we do a simple energy balance, assuming that our solid is isothermal, or we're just trying to solve for the surface temperature, then we can do just a simple algebraic energy balance. Except now we're trying to solve for the temperature profile, so we need to use this partial differential equation known as the heat equation to solve this. So solving this differential equation will give us more information than just a single temperature. It'll give us how does temperature vary with, with space or with time. Okay, so let's look at the heat equation. Again, it's a big, very complicated equation that can be extremely difficult to solve unless you're able to make some simplifying assumptions. So let's go through and figure out what simplifying assumptions we can make. So first, we are assuming that the system is at steady state, which means that temperature will not be changing with time. So we can get rid of our accumulation term in this differential energy balance. We're also not told anything about volumetric generation within our solid, so we can get rid of the generation term. And then we're told that we can treat it as a plane wall, so temperature only varies in one direction, being that x direction. So we're going to keep this x term, but we can just get rid of the y and z terms. If we assume that our thermal conductivity is constant, I mean it's as in it's not varying in terms of x or t, then our heat equation really gets simplified to this simple plane wall one-dimensional form, k times the second derivative of temperature is equal to zero. And if you remembered um, from the last time, if we have a finite quantity multiplied by another finite quantity and the product of those is zero, then we can assume that one or the other of these is zero. We know that k is not zero, so we can div so that means we know that this part is zero. So we could divide both sides through by k, and that k just sort of magically disappears from our equation. So we're solving this particular equation. So as we did last time, we're going to separate and integrate. So First, let's do a separation step. So what we did is we moved one of the dx's over to the right-hand side, leaving us on the left-hand side with just the derivative of the derivative of temperature. So if we integrate now, we end up with dt dx is equal to the integral here, 0, um, the integral of 0 dx is just going to be, it's going to be 0 plus the constant of integration. So it's really just the constant of integration that we need to be concerned with. Okay, so unlike last time when we integrated this to get the full generic version of the temperature profile with constant c1 and c2, we're going to do a little trick here to make our lives easier. So we're going to think about the boundary conditions. Remember that because this is a second order differential equation with respect to x, we're going to need two boundary conditions in order to fully solve this problem. So what are our boundary conditions? Last time we were just given two surface temperatures, so we just integrated all the way into temperature form and then applied our two surface temperature boundary conditions. This time it's different. This time we only have one surface temperature given, but the 
other boundary condition, so we want to think about what might be happening elsewhere, we have this other boundary condition here, that Q double prime at x equals zero is equal to 600 watts per meter squared. So before integrating more, I'm going to use this little trick where I'm going to apply that flux boundary condition right now. So this is a flux boundary condition rather than a constant surface temperature boundary condition. So how do we do this? So we can think about this by doing a small energy balance here on this control surface. So the surface energy balance is, I'll do this quickly, um, so we basically have our in term, Q double prime, has got to be equal to our out term. So energy is getting into that control surface by this sunlight, it's just this constant flux hitting the surface. How is it getting out? Well, it's getting out by conduction, so it's conducting out of there. So how do we quantify a conductive heat rate or a conductive heat flux? We need to use Fourier's law. So it's getting out by Fourier's law of conduction, which says that the flux leaving that control surface is going to be minus K times dt dx. And this would apply at x equals zero. Okay, so how do we use this boundary condition to solve for constant C1? So we can rearrange this equation and we can get that dt dx as evaluated at x equals zero is going to be equal to minus Q double prime over K. So we just solved this, um, we solved this surface energy balance for dt dx and we found that the derivative at that particular point is just this constant minus Q double prime over K and it turns out because C1 equals that same quantity we know that C1 is equal to minus Q double prime over K. So this is just a little trick. When you have one of your boundary conditions being in this flux form, or this could be a convective term as well, or an insulated term, it's good to pause right here while your equation is still in this uh, first order differential equation form and solve your boundary condition there. Okay, I hope I haven't lost you, so let's continue. So now we're going to integrate this equation to get this into temperature form. So we have dt dx equal to C1. I'm going to go ahead and plug in this guy for C1. This is just a constant, so it's a little bit of a pain to write it out, but just in the back of your head just think everything in there is just a constant, so I can just treat that as one big lumped term. Okay, so now let's separate so we have dt is equal to minus q double prime over k times dx. Then we can integrate and we get t is equal to minus q double prime over k times x. The integral of dx is x plus our second constant of integration. So that's where we are right now. So how do we get C2 at this point? So this is the generic form of the equation, somewhat generic. We uh, still don't know what C2 is. So now we could apply our other boundary condition. So let me just move to the next slide. So we have T equals minus Q double prime over K plus C2. Our other boundary condition is at at x equals L, where L is the thickness. I don't know if I specified that. So L is the thickness of this wall. We have our temperature is equal to TS2. So we substitute this in, oh, there's supposed to be an X there. Yep, okay. We substitute that in for X and we substitute this TS2 in for temperature and we get TS2 is equal to minus Q double prime over K multiplied by L plus C2. We solve for C2. 
So that just requires some really simple rearranging. And we get that C2 is equal to TS2 plus Q double prime over K times L. Okay, so now all we need to do is take our C2 and put this back into the general form of the equation to get this specific form of the equation with our boundary conditions in enforced. So we get T is equal to minus Q double prime over K times X plus our C2, which is just T S2 plus Q double prime over K times L. And we can actually rearrange that equation to just make it look a little prettier. So our temperature as a function of x is going to be equal to TS2 plus Q double prime over K multiplied by L minus x. So this is actually the equation of a line. Um, if we go back to this form, so here we have the intercept and then here we have the slope. So it's just a straight line, just as it was last time, except the algebra just works out to be a little different because of our different boundary conditions. So there we go. And what did this problem actually ask us to solve? It wanted us to find the temperature profile. So here it is. Um, so let's, so we know, we know this guy, we know this guy, we know this guy, and we know this guy. So now we could just plot this as a function of x. So just to kind of check our work, so we've answered the problem here. We have derived the temperature profile, and it's nice to kind of leave it in this prettier algebraic form rather than put a bunch of ugly numbers in there. But just to check our work, let's try substituting some numbers into it. So first let's look at what is the temperature when x is equal to L. In other words, what's the temperature here? Well, we know what it is. It's 32 degrees C, but we want to make sure that our equation accurately re reflects that. So if we plugged in L here, so if we plugged in L for x, we see that L minus L is 0. This whole term goes away, and we're left with TS2, which is 32 degrees, so we're, we're good there. Let's plug in some numbers. Let's do another check to see, okay, we can use this equation. It's a temperature profile. It'll tell us temperature at any point along here. Let's just check a point at the top. Do we expect this to be higher or lower than 32 degrees? So just testing our intuition. I would expect this to be higher because we have energy coming in here um, via sunlight. So I'd expect this to be higher and we'd expect that heat to dissipate also heat is flowing this way and that uh, for that heat to continue to flow all the way through we need to have a temperature driving force so we expect this temperature to be higher so let's just check and we can actually figure out what that temperature is so let's evaluate t at x equals zero so we get its ts2 and actually let me plug in the actual numbers at this point 32 degrees C plus Q double prime is 600, and that's watts per meter squared. We divide that by K, and K is 15 watts per meter per Kelvin. L is 0 0.15 meters and then x is just zero meters because we're right at the top. Okay so if we do that we end up with a surface temperature on the top of 38 degrees C so it is in fact hotter. So what that tells us is the Sun is certainly heating up this whole wall but it provides a little bit of insulation so that this TS2 is lower than TS1 because of the insulative effect of the wall. Let's just go back and make sure we're good on units. So let me switch colors here. So watts cancel out. Um, one of these meters cancels out there. The other one cancels out there. And we're left with Kelvin on the top. So we have 32 degrees plus this other 6 degrees Kelvin, which would, because it's a delta T, um, 
we, that is equivalent to degrees Celsius. So again, we have proven that you can take this complex esoteric equation that may not make a ton of sense at first, but we're breaking it down, we're simplifying it, and we're using this to extract some really useful information like how does temperature change through a wall. These kind of problems are really important in energy engineering and chemical engineering and mechanical engineering and a lot of other fields.